I am happy that you put as a title evangelization and uh, vocation. Because if the title was uh, vocation and evangelization, probably I, I should ask to change uh, the order. But since it uh, was correct, uh, I will try to share with you some reflections, first of all, on evangelization and uh, how evangelization call people to share the joy of the encounter with Jesus Christ. One of the distinctive features of Christianity is the notion of being embedded in history. The church, my dear friends, cannot be effective in her work of evangelization if she forgets two aspects. First of all, how to enter into the culture. Second, how to create history. These two poles cannot be separated. To remain connected to the story of our time, it is necessary to look at the phenomena that force the church to rethink her work of evangelization. Just as in the past, she inserted herself into the cultural context of Greece and then in Rome how she was capable for, of reaching cultures in the ear of the great missionary history, Mexico, Africa, Japan, China, Amazonia. Similarly today, the church reflects on how to inculturate the gospel to think of evangelization as if the need for inculturation did not exist is not a viable path to go down. The courage of evangelization inexorably pushes us to discover new paths and to follow them under the working of the Spirit who cannot be limited to merely human calculations. In this context, the duty that falls to the church today in her work of evangelization seems to me to be twofold. On the one hand, the need to pass on that which has always been believed by everyone and everywhere. This is the content of our faith. On the other hand, the need to understand the new emerging culture that will define the coming centuries, the digital culture. My dear friends, Everybody has this one. There is someone who doesn't? No one. This is not an instrument. This is a new culture. People with 20, 25 years, they live with this culture. That is different from my generation. For me, is an instrument. For there is a culture, style of life, a new language. For this reason, they cannot understand us. Because within this one, language is synthetic, essential. They write immediately and then they read what they wrote. This is a problem. 
Because within this and within this culture, there is no more time and space. The two categories that we normally we use. In this culture, you have immediately, immediately an answer. You call and you answer. With this one, there is no more a critical reflection. In this culture, it becomes always a lack of dynamic memory. You have a static memory. You can put everything in your telephone, but you can you have the, uh, the, the the problem to keep in your mind and your memory. And our memory is dynamic. The memory of the digital culture is static. You ask and we respond. If we don't have this digital culture in front of us, let me say we cannot understand the new way of evangelization and uh, the vocation of new generations. This is not just uh, to have a home page. This is not just uh, the case to have in uh, each of our parishes a home page, because this is information. How and which kind of language we use in our home page. This is the problem. Internet certainly represent an opportunity for dialogue, social exchanges between people, as well as easy of access to knowledge and information. But the real question is how to evangelize, how can be our presence in a digital continent a presence of evangelization. This is not only using digital instrument. Evangelization, it means to offer spaces where are experiences of faith, where an interpersonal encounter enters up being the winning card. Otherwise, we will be confronted with a virtualization of evangelization that too closely resembles other virtual worlds with the real risk of ending with a weak and ineffective evangelization. That which arises to the surface, consequently, is our vocation to mission. Let me say very clear, without the mission, there is no church. We will always have to be very radical about this. Moreover, the mission is the proclamation of a truth that has been passed on the, under the responsibility of dynamically maintaining in its integrity until the end of time. What we call the deposit of faith is not something static, it's dynamic. We have the responsibility to increase it. What we offer are not technical instrument or material means, but the announcement of the salvation brought about by the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The church was read and created by the Lord so that his gospel of salvation would reach all people. 
this call for an understanding of a community that grows in the knowledge of its Lord and by virtue of this lives in the commitment to communicate him to everybody, to all the world. The mission, the evangelization, is an intrinsic element to Christianity. And at the same time, it becomes a judgment criteria for the effectiveness pastoral work. We should judge our pastoral work not for how many Eucharist Sunday we celebrate and not for how many people we be present at our Eucharistic Mass. We should have another criterion, how the gospel goes around all the world. My dear friends, without the push for missionary outreach, the church loses strength and falls into the temptation to stand on its own and in its own structures, no longer possessing passion for the proclamation that makes her truly the body of Christ. For there to be an understanding of the mission, however, it is necessary to discover the value of the truth, the value of the truth of our faith. If we no longer live with a true understanding of the responsibility that the mission of proclaiming the gospel has been entrusted to us, this is probably due to the fact that there no longer is a full awareness of the intrinsically truthful value that our faith possesses. I'm very sorry, but the problem of truth is still on the table. We cannot put under the table. If all religions are the same, and if there isn't really only one truth, given the great number of people in the world, what sense will it make to become missionary of Christ? If the newness and the originality of the revelation of Jesus Christ is discarded, the very presence of the church in the contemporary world becomes useless. But evangelization happens under the light of an encounter. The vocational dimension rests in its entirety on this concept. To begin with, we must address our relationship with the Lord. Has there truly been an encounter? When did I find the Lord? When did I encounter him? What did that encounter do in me? These, my dear friend, are not rhetorical questions. They demand us to return to our roots, our vocation, and the purpose of being ministers of the Lord for his church. A ministry that first and foremost is accomplished by the power of the Spirit that has descended upon us. Evangelize, therefore, by laying these two pillars down, 
our personal calling as a consequence of our encounter with the Lord. Let me say, first of all, to me, first, personally, but to each of you. Did encounter really Jesus Christ? Did encounter him personally? This is the question. No other one. Now, the word of God comes to our head when it comes to confirming the account of the calling of the disciples. Today is the Feast of St. Mark, and we go to the Gospel of Mark. Just in the beginning, chapter 1, 16. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he sees Peter and his brother Andrew, and they are putting away their nets, for they were fishermen. The evangelists tell us nothing more, only the essential, so as to not distract us. If we wish to know something more, some more detail, we turn to Luke. Here we can capture two details that should not go ignored. The first, Luke, is chapter 5. He, Jesus, he was standing with the crowd pressing around him, listening to the word of God. The second, that Jesus caught sight of two empty boats at the water's edge. Because, he explains, the fishermen had got out and were washing their nets. Luke, interesting, Luke does not immediately tell us of the fishermen's disappointment. We worked hard all night long and caught nothing. The fact that Jesus is preaching the gospel is too important to change the subject right away. So Jesus is preaching. Then he enters on one of the boats, Simon's boat, and asks him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowd from the boat. Which content of this preaching? The content, surely, was what Mark tells us in its essentiality. The time is fulfilled. More, literally, translation. The time has been filled. Time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is close at hand. The kingdom of God is near to you. Repent and believe to the gospel. Announcement of the salvation brought about by God. And then an invitation to conversation, conversion and faith as a personal response. The kingdom of God is among us. This is the fact. 
And this is the chaos. This is what is put in my hands. Now, look how interesting is the, uh, the Gospel of Mark. Only after the proclamation, Jesus turned to Simon, asking him to set out and cast out the fishing nets once more. Simon in this moment is really very humble. He's not arrogant. Because, you know, Jesus, Jesus said to him, put the nets on the right side. If I was there, probably, I should say to Jesus, hey, Jesus, I am the fisherman. You are a carpenter. Do your job and I do my job. Because during the day, there is no fish at all. We are fishing during the night. But this is not the answer. This was my answer. The answer, the answer of Simon is different. Because Simon was touched by the preaching of the Lord. He understood immediately that, that God was close to him. He understood immediately that this, for, 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 for him, the time was fulfilled. The time had now come. This is the feeling of Peter. I will let down the nets. And they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. We take another teaching. Can you see the first response is calling order for help. They call their partners in the other boat to come and help them. My dear friends, when there is so much work involved, it cannot be done alone. There is the risk of the nets breaking and losing all. It takes humility to ask for help and generosity to share the outcome. The first partners to arrive are James and John, the sons of ZBD who, inspired by friendship, rush to help Simon. But, however, for John and James too, there is something essentially. Jesus saw them. Jesus saw them. The call to sharing of the work comes from Peter. But the choice to follow Jesus is grace placed under the gaze, the gates of Jesus and his personal call to follow him. No one can substitute for the call. There may be mediations but the encounter with Christ must be personal. The master's eyes 
must be on mine. And only then does the encounter become a vocation. If Jesus see you, Jesus, the eyes of Jesus on my eyes. It is important, therefore, to grasp even from these details the teaching the scripture intends to place in our hands. When the word of God is proclaimed, people listen and crowd around Jesus, not around us. We are called to discover that that word is a first of all addressed to me personally and thus to be received into my boat, the boat of my existence. It calls us to ask ourselves questions, especially the fundamental one about the meaning of my life. Someone fulfilled my time. The time has come for me to put out to sea and get Jesus on my boat. Only in this way does work become positive. Only in this work, only in this way will be full of meaning. With Jesus, we call others so that they may share our work, our experience of grace. And in this way, when Jesus has seen my boat and choose to come into it, I become able to share with others the same grace. What uh, very quickly follows is some team radical that uh, leaves one surprised, but which is only understood the moment one grabs for newness of the person who come and in which he must entrust. Those who proclaim the word of God are vested with an authority that comes from above, but requires of those who accept it to be disciples, no lords or masters, always and only disciples of the only master, Jesus Christ. And also, my dear friend, the work doesn't begin in Jerusalem or in Judea. The preaching of the Lord is most in the peripheral region, populated by simple, illiterate people, Galilee. What we are told is that Jesus proclaimed good news that consists of the nearness of God. God is in our midst. The use of the term news should not be overlooked. It is of a paramount importance. It means the first and foremost the communication of a fact, an event. In fact, we are not being presented with a teaching, nor a spiritual exhortation, nor a homily, and much less a theory for societal improvement. Not at all. The reference to news is to emphasize the underlying truth 
It is an event. It is a fact in which I am personally involved and need an answer from me. Discovery, the primacy of God in our lives and the power of his grace becomes the means by which we can consciously come to direct one's existence. A vocation is never an improvisation. Rather, it is the discovery of a project that comes from afar and of which perhaps due to distraction I was not yet aware. We should repeat with Paul, when God who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to be able to grasp this moment in our life. Let me say, the church, my dear friends, does not evangelize because she is faced with the great challenge of secularism but because she must be obedient to the Lord's command to bring the gospel to every creature. This is our vocation. And for this reason, we are called to accompany people and to accompany people in discovering every day more the truth on our life and the truth of the world. If I can give you a last suggestion, please read, if you didn't yet, read the beautiful book of Bernanos, The Diary of a country priest. It's a beautiful reading where we discover that uh, the country priest doesn't have a name. Everybody in the book, they have a name. Everybody except the priest. Because this priest is the icon of all the priests in the world. And the fact that he doesn't have a name, it doesn't mean to humiliate him. On the contrary, it makes him better the icon of everybody of us. the essential of this, the diary, is on the end of the book. Everything is grace. This is the discovery of our life. Everything is grace. For this reason, my dear friend, let me say, the boldness of God choosing me. When uh, she said, uh, my brother told me, when I told my mother, very, very holy, holy mother, when I, I told her, I want to become priest, she said, you? Your brother, your brother can be a priest because he's, a, he's more good than you. You are not so good enough to be a priest. Your brother probably. Why you? Because God chose me. I have nothing. In fact, my brother 
was better than me. But he chose me. The boldness of God to choose me. To choose someone of us. Nor for our capacities. Nor for our intelligence. Nor for our beauty. Just for his boldness. I choose you. I saw you. I put my eyes in your eyes. Let me conclude with, uh, you mentioned answers from Balthazar. Let me conclude with uh, a beautiful uh, expression of uh, from Balthazar. He wrote, a good priest is always a miracle of faith and grace. More often, it happens that the churches have to suffer under those who have not fulfilled their vocation. There are too many who, whether from the episcopal throne or from pulpit, delude themselves that they are the light. Such men should be avoided. They speak of God while thinking on themselves, and God does not appear. Let us not forget the sacramental grace of the priestly office. It helps one to break out of oneself, to spoil oneself, but it cannot substitute the spoiling. For one who is consecrated, not to embrace this spoiling is to provoke a negative effect. Perhaps only necessity teaches priests to return to prayer. Meanwhile, we pray for them. Thank you.